our um, focus is the book of Nahum. Now, if I were to, well, th- think about uh, uh, the survey that Linda sends out where she does these, these uh, interviews with different members, get to know so-and-so member. Um, I th- she asks, I think, favorite Bible character and favorite Bible story. I can't remember if it's every favorite Bible book. But anyway, something like that. I doubt anyone uh, in our circles is going to say their favorite book is Nahum. Um, the reality is Nahum is just a very understudied book. Um, your, your probably closest uh, association with it is when you sing the books of the Bible or say the books of the Bible. Otherwise, my guess is Nahum is a book you don't turn to very often. Um, but it's a uh, gripping, powerful, uh, gut-wrenching book. Um, and it, it really speaks to the heart of human suffering, uh, especially human suffering at the hands of violent oppressors. And so um, those who've experienced trauma or, or uh, any, any form of, of oppression, um, whether it's on a small scale, especially on a large scale, um, man, Nahum is, is a book that speaks to that situation. Um, anyway, um, so, so there's, there's, there's a ton here. We'll, we'll walk through it and think through some things together tonight. Um, hopefully, uh, it's, it's an edifying and instructive and, and encouraging study um, and challenges. I, I, I know that there's going to be some things that we talk about that are going to challenge our, our, our thinking and our, our sort of our gut a little bit, you know, sort of our gut impulses to some, some things. Um, and so hopefully we all have ears to hear and, and simply can just think through what the scriptures say. And ultimately in this, as we've sought to do in every prophet book that we've looked at, like we would with any study, but it's, it's been our special focus as we've walked through the prophets is ultimately this is about helping us understand God and know him better. Um, so let's begin in prayer and then we'll walk through the book of Nahum together. Father, we, um, we praise you because you are uh, a great king and a righteous and wise and merciful judge. Um, you are aware of our heartache and the chaos and evil that we live around. Um, you see, you hear, and you have promised to act. Help us, Lord, to take refuge in you and to walk with you and trust in you and hope in you. Please be with us now as we study the book of Nahum. Give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, give us hearts of understanding, and may we love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we'll do our sort of basic background sketch. I called it a stat sheet tonight, a brief background stat sheet. So again, as we've done, like to start with the meaning of the, the prophet's name, because oftentimes that comes into play at some point in the book. The name Nahum means comfort or consolation. And as I've said, I've not always made a direct correlation for you or helped uh, connect those dots super clearly, um, but be on the lookout for how this book can connect to the name Nahum, meaning comfort or consolation. In other words, how is the book of Nahum a message of comfort and consolation? All right, the object of prophecy, Nineveh. You'll see, you look at verse 1 of chapter 1, the oracle of Nineveh, or the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. Right? So, so Nahum is, has this oracle, has this message about Nineveh. And, and more specifically, it's going to be a, a oracle of judgment against Nineveh. Now, we say the object of prophecy because Nineveh is in view. But in terms of his audience, the reality is this is a message for Judah um, and, and, and uh, Jerusalem and, and the southern kingdom. Um, and the people of God throughout the ages. And so even though we say the object of prophecy is Nineveh, the reality is, and we'll see this as we walk through the text, this is, this is a message that would apply about every oppressive power throughout history. And so we'll see some of those 
lines of connection as we walk through this. And then just a few key events um, uh, in, in, to kind of situate the book of Nahum and the events that Nahum's going to talk about in, in history. Samaria, the capital of the northern city, fell at the hands of the Assyrians in 722. Um, a little over a hundred years later, the city of Nineveh, which was the Assyrian capital, fell in 612, right? A little bit later than that, Jerusalem itself is going to fall. Um, and and, and the, the Bible will, and history will describe three various stages of deportation, 605, and that's when Daniel and his uh, contemporaries and his colleagues would have been carried off into captivity, uh, 597, where you have Ezekiel and the, the, the groups that were around Ezekiel, and then finally 587, when the walls are destroyed, the temple's destroyed, and you have the last bands of exiles carried out of the city. Again, let me reiterate, I've tried to say this throughout, I don't give dates as, as things to memorize. Feel free to do that if that's your thing. Um, but I do give them as reference points just so that we can sort of conceptually map this in our head and, and, and understand sort of where we are in relationship to some of these events, but also where Nahum is in relation to some of these events. So if you can sort of see, all right, Samaria fell, Nineveh fell, Jerusalem fell. All right, Nahum enters somewhere just before the fall of Nineveh. Um, we don't have any concrete anchor points that fix that in time, and so we just give a range of, you know, 20, 20 years up to just the, you know, the event itself, very near the event itself. And, and then I give you Jonah, because if you remember, Jonah was sent to Nineveh a little over a hundred years before Nahum's prophesying. So about a hundred years later, after the story of Jonah, where we see God forgiving Nineveh, he sent Jonah to, to declare, um, yet in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed, right? That was Jonah's message to, to warn them of that judgment. And, and yet they repented and God graciously forgave them. But now over a hundred years later, we see this, this prophet of Nahum declaring their downfall. Um, so anyway, that's just our stat sheet for tonight, just to give us some, some basic background um, reference points for us. And if you're a student of history or like, like, like history and archaeology, those are some, some anchor points for you to like build off and study a little bit further. But let's go ahead and get into the text itself. Um, oh, before I do that, one, one thing I, I want to say about the Assyrians. We've talked in previous studies about the Assyrians' reputation for extreme cruelty and violence. They would um, torture their captives uh, in the most violent and shameful ways. They would flay them alive. They would mutilate them, cutting off, you know, noses and ears and um, hands and feet and eyes and things like that. Um, they, would, they would carry them away by putting hooks in their noses or in their mouths and sort of as this chain gang lead people away in, into, as, as captives into their uh, camps and, and exile and all that stuff. Sometimes they would impale people. And so what I've just, I've gathered a few images there's a there's a Syrian reliefs in the British Museum, and so here's some some snapshots of that. Just so you can see, if you look at this one, you can you can see where they've taken the heads of their captives and they're just throwing the heads of their captives, and they would they would create these big piles of their captors' heads. Um, here's one where they're getting ready to either cut off a head, or I think the image is of a club, and they're going to club someone, uh, club captives to death. Here's a, a shot, or here's a, a carving or a relief of, of people being impaled. And then another one uh, is showing that, right? Um, I, I show these so we can, we can sort of see again in history just how cruel these were. Impaling was an early ancient precursor to crucifixion that the Romans perfected and, and really dialed in. And so that gives us another line of connection as well throughout the scriptures. But to, to just appreciate how wicked, cruel, unjust um, the Assyrians were. All right, now, now we'll go ahead and get on into the text. All right, here, here's the, the first bit of the outline. We'll, we'll share the, the rest of it later. But as we've seen with every prophet book, there's normally some sort of just brief heading that says a little bit about the author and the object of prophecy, if, if nothing else. 
Um, but then this, this book opens up with a description of God. Before we get into any oracle against Nineveh or anything like that, any, any indictment, any warning of judgment, any of those things, this book opens up with a powerful, again, gut-wrenching, soul-shaking description of God, followed by a very pointed warning that begins to be addressed at Nineveh. Let's read that together, and then we're going to process before we move on. Nahum chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. I'm reading from the New American Standard. A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power, and Yahweh will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. That's the opening description of God. And, and hear the warning. Whatever you devise against Yahweh, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. Like tangled thorns, like those who are drunken with their drink, they are consumed as stubble completely withered. From you has gone forth one who plotted evil against Yahweh, a wicked counselor. Cheery, right? Um, l- let me ask you a question reading that. Just listen to these opening lines again. A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? Um, Is that awkward for you to think of God in those terms, to describe God in those terms? Is that the part of the Bible that you sort of want to shy away from? You know, we can talk about God's love and God's grace and God's mercy and even justice, right, if we think in terms of restorative justice, but avenging, wrathful. Um, My guess is for most of us, um, especially um, younger generations, um, that's an incredibly awkward and, and truthfully challenging thing for us to really hear and think about. And so before we even walk through the text, I want to step back a little bit and process a little bit about God's judgment. Help us, help us um, be able to connect with the scriptures, because I I recognize um, my own instinct sometimes, and also just countless people I've taught and studied with, um, or recognize, um, struggle to, to, to grapple with these in a and, and connect with these and appreciate these and understand these things. Um, and, and so I want to spend some time thinking about that. The first thing I want to do is just acknowledge some aspects of, of our struggle with God's judgment, some of the contributing factors to why we struggle with this judgment language that we see in the scriptures. Uh, I won't pretend to, to provide an exhaustive list, this is just simply things that, that I've observed in my own experiences, um, my own struggles, as well as, as well as others, as I've said, that I've taught and studied with in the past and, and even recently. Um, the, the first thing is, one, just recognizing cultural influence. There's a lot that's packed into that line, right, when we recognize cultural influence. But if If we feel awkward saying Yahweh is avenging and wrathful or shy away from that, 
that's probably um, various forces, strands, messages, narratives from our culture that have shaped us to, to think that or feel that, right? They've shaped our gut in, in that way, our heart in that way. And I'm not saying that from an overly critical standpoint, just as a, more as a matter of fact. Um, we all recognize um, that we're constantly bombarded with narratives and stories and, and ph- philosophies and thoughts and all sorts of things like that that are going to grind against the scriptures. Um, and so just just recognizing that that this kind of thing, talking about judgment, talking about retribution against enemies, indignation against evil, against sin, um, is not PC, is not, again, in, in harmony with the spirit of our age. So just acknowledging that up front. Again, not necessarily just criticizing that, just acknowledging that. Another contributing factor that, that, I, that I see is, is that in many church circles, in many different experiences, what we've, what we've heard, been taught, or at least heard, whether it's been said this way or this is what we've ended up taking home, has been actually a caricature of God's judgment that looks more like the pagan narratives than the biblical narratives, or the, more like the pagan view of God more than the biblical view of God. For example, the, the, the view of an angry God who is ready to uh, roast people with fire or eternally condemn people to hell for the slightest misstep. Or if you've ever been afraid that you're not doing enough or that, you know, if you don't get all this right, God's going to send you to hell. Or, man, if you misunderstand this passage or you don't do this perfectly, all of that is a caricature of God. And a caricature of his judgment. Um, it's a gross reduction of what the scriptures actually say about the wise, merciful, and righteous king who will judge his creation and, and hold uh, his creation accountable um, and set things right. Um, and, and so just acknowledging that, that um, I, I think sometimes responses, negative responses, or at least uh, resisting some of what the, what, what the scriptures say about judgment comes from a place, uh, I think a, a good um, place in our gut where we recognize, yeah, this character, character isn't right. <laughs> um, we're right to resist that. We're right to push back and say, no, that's not okay. That's not righteous. That's not just. And, and so, and, and, and again, I would agree with that. And the scriptures would agree with that. What the scriptures are going to say about God and his judgment and his wrath are much fuller and more robust than that reductionist caricature of the angry God who's going to just destroy everyone who couldn't keep his law perfectly and, and things like that. So again, just acknowledging that up front. Um, another thing is, um, maybe coming from something like legalism or from that caricature of the angry God and starting to see God as gracious and merciful and embracing his grace. Well, kind of coming to that side, we recognize, okay, the the scriptures do say something like what Nahum says, avenging, wrathful, um, just, righteous judgment, those kinds of things. So how do these things harmonize? And so maybe, maybe some of our struggle with judgment is just not knowing how these, these various descriptions of God, the, the multifaceted nature of his character, um, uh, how these things harmonize and how they, they fit together. And, and again, that's okay. That's just acknowledging a struggle. Um, and, and, and then here's, here's another one. And this, this all of these may get to the heart of it at different points, but but this one in particular, um, for for many of us, I, I, I won't say all of us, and I won't even say most of us, but I, but I know for many of us, um, we've we've lived relatively sheltered lives from uh, systemic levels of oppression and injustice and and violence and things like that. Um, very likely, some that are listening have been victims of of abuse at a at a personal level, 
And so that's a very powerful touch point with what God says about judgment and justice and righteousness and how he will respond to evil. Um, But most of us haven't experienced it at this sort of national level, this this sort of cultural, societal level. Um, We we weren't victims of the Holocaust. Um, We weren't uh, victims of apartheid in South Africa. Um, things like that. So, so understanding that, that people who, who are, who have, who have experienced those kinds of evils, the violence, the oppression by, again, not just individuals, even though that's certainly valid and, and, uh, 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 is a part of this, but, but these forces and powers and systems and, and movements of evil, um, and, 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 and the, the, the sort of shelter from those experiences make it hard for us to connect with this in the same way as those who, who would. Um, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, wouldn't have to be talking about this with, with people who have, have experienced those. They get it, again, not just at a head level, but at a gut level. They know this is not right. God's got to do something about it. And then I just said others. Uh, again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just responding to different things that I've, I've seen and experienced and talked with pe- different people. Touch points for why we struggle with God's judgment. Let me offer then a, a few things on the other side and some, some observations maybe to help us connect with it. Maybe at a head level, maybe at a gut level. Um, the first is just one, recognizing that, that at least in Nahum and so many of these prophets, this judgment is against systems, corrupt, evil, oppressive, wicked systems more than individuals. It's not that he's not holding individuals account, so don't misunderstand me. But the judgment is more sweeping against the powers, against the forces, against the nations, against the cultures um, that have been filled up with the evil, recognizing that there may be some individuals who are innocent, um, many individuals who have contributed to that whole, but many who are innocent. The, um, uh, the archetype for God's judgment in the Bible is, is certainly Sodom and Gomorrah. And what did God say about that? As corrupt and as, as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah was, where he, he said, I would destroy the whole city and civilization. What do you say? If there were 10 righteous individuals, he'd save the whole thing. So it shows us, okay, God's He's taking care of the individuals. In fact, we saw in Micah that idea of a remnant. He's protecting those who are innocent. And so seeing, okay, these statements of judgment are, are, are leveled against um, systems, right? So, so let, let me make that. That won't answer all our questions or difficulties, but that's at least a star, an important starting point. Um, here's another thing we need to recognize. The eradication of evil is a necessary part of restoration, we think about all the beautiful images of hope that the prophets are full, full of, right? We spend a lot of time in Micah looking at the dreams of the kingdom. Um, There's so many of these in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and other parts of the 12, um, where, where, where is this picture of God reigning. Um, you know, the, the language of new creation is there. The earth will be full of the, the, the glory of Yahweh as the water covers the sea. And he describes this this peace, this shalom, this human flourishing. He describes joy and rejoicing. He describes um, uh, justice and righteousness and all these things of beauty, right? Life and fullness and abundance, all this stuff, right? Right? What, what's vital to that picture of beauty and glory that we long for is the fact that evil has been dealt with. Um, there are no tears because there are no more ca- things that cause tears. There's no more shame because there's no more things or, or forces or powers or beings that cause shame. There's no more death because even that evil has been dealt with, right? Um, and, and so as long as evil remains um, undealt with, there'll never be 
just, it will never flourish in justice or righteousness. There'll never be peace. There'll never be joy. There'll never be full rejoicing. Fractions. That's exactly what we experience now in this present evil age. As long as those things remain, yeah, we, we experience joy here and here and here, little glimpses, but it's, our life is also marked by suffering. And so again, recognizing that dealing with evil is a necessary part of restoration. Another thing, understand that this, this judgment language that so, is so intense, and we can even say horrifying, is corresponding to the horror of the evil. Um, we read the judgment scenes and think, man, that's a bit much. The evil is what's much, right? The evil itself, the, the, we'll read about in, in, in Nahum uh, how Nineveh is being sacked and, and overthrown and things like that. Um, man, how many civilizations and cities did they do that and worse to, right? And so the horror of the judgment language is, is intentionally corresponding to the horror of the evil. The cross is doing the same thing, by the way. Like our second point, but, but slightly different, judgment of the oppressors is salvation for the oppressed. Think about the plagues against Egypt. What was that doing? That was God saving his people. Um, again, part of God rescuing us and saving us from our enemies means he's defeating our enemies, defeating our oppressors. Um, and then the last one. And, and, and this is a little bit more precise. These others are sort of big picture. These are, these are, this, this last one's sort of getting into our own heart in this uh, and how we process some of these things. Biblically, there's a difference between demanding judgment from a place of self-centered pride, as we saw in the book of Jonah. In the book of Jonah, there God's challenging his selfishness and his pride and his sense of, I'm right and they're wrong and this sort of circles and exclusiveness that, that he wanted to have. And God wanted to show him his mercy, his compassion, his forgiveness breaks our boundaries and our borders and our boxes and is for all. And so he was countering that sort of self-centered, self-absorbed pride. The same thing we see in, in Jesus' day with the Pharisees when they look down on Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners and he gives the parable of the the, the lost sheep and the lost coin uh, and, and, and then the lost sons, plural, right? The prodigal son and the older brother who's the, the object of the, the rebuke there. There's a difference between that and crying for judgment from a place of humility and oppression, right? There's countless, or it would take you a long time to count them, places in scripture that correspond with this last aspect, right? The humble, faithful person who is being just beaten up, torn down, ripped to shreds, oppressed and, and hurt so badly, crying out for God to do something to deal with evil, right? The Jonah versus the psalmist, those are very different hearts, very different orientations, very different uh, approaches towards God. And so the, the scriptures acknowledge that distinction. All right. So we spent a, spent a good amount of time doing that, but I, I think that's so necessary that we do pause and really process some of those things to hear, um, to hear this. So then with that, we turn back to our text and, and think about this, this opening declaration of God. It's a statement of God as Someone who will deal with evil. He's avenging and wrathful. Yet, look at, verse, look at verse 3. He's slow to anger and great in power. See, this is, the, the, and I, I should have said this in our list, but this is another part of the rub where we, when, when we hear statements about God's anger and God's wrath and God's judgment, we bring him to a human level and the way we or Others in history would respond with this sort of flippant anger. Someone cut me off in traffic and I get angry about it. Or someone wounds me really deep and I hold this. You know, that's our anger. That's our wrath. And it's hardly ever just. It's hardly ever right. God is slow to anger. 
right? So when he's angry, you know it's exactly for, for a good and right cause. He's slow to anger and will by no means, verse 3, leave the guilty unpunished, right? This is, you might recognize some of that phraseology. Um, it's actually a quote from Exodus 34. We talked about that a few weeks ago during our Jonah study. Um, remember, Jonah quotes the first part of that um, with this sort of bitter indignation. I know you're gracious and compassionate. He's so angry that, that God would, would grant that compassion to the, to the Assyrians, the Ninevites. Um, yet here, Nahum's quoting it. Uh, and the, in the full picture, the end of it there to show yet, He's gracious and compassionate, just like we saw him extend them. Yet they persist in that injustice and that violence and that cruelty. He'll by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And I think over a hundred years in between Jonah and Nahum um, is sufficiency to say, yes, God is slow to anger. But look at this, and this is the other side. And we talked about this a little bit in that step back, but look at verse seven. Yahweh is good a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him, right? See, again, that's what I said where, where judgment against the oppressor is salvation for the oppressed, right? Because look at what he's doing as he judges evil, as he judges the oppressor. It's the, it's the weak, it's the oppressed who come to him, who seek him, who take refuge in him and find him to be the source of good and benefit and blessing and hope and healing and protection, right? Um, a little bit of a, well, I won't, I won't go into that. Um, but anyway, ho- hopefully we, we have this, this picture, at least are, are, are building maybe some better categories and starting to, to, to help connect with some of these things. Even if there's some more wrestling that you need to do, I, I urge you to at least do that, to wrestle through it and, and have those ears to hear that say, all right, I, I want to know God. And I want to I want to understand these these claims these proclamations of who he is and 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 let that then shape me rather than me imposing my view of God and thinking he has to conform to these standards and values and fit into this box. No, let me step back. Let me reevaluate. Let me break down some of my assumptions in my categories and rebuild them with a with a fuller view of who God is. So again, this opening description of God um, followed by this pointed warning at those who would rebel against him. And then what we see in the end of chapter 1 is these two initial decrees, one of salvation and one of judgment. Let's hear those. Verse 12, thus says Yahweh, though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so they will be cut off and pass away. Right, so that's here. He's addressing his people, though they've they are great and mighty and have done all this stuff. Though I've afflicted you, I'll afflict you no longer. So now I'll break his yoke bar from upon you, and I'll tear off your shackles. Right, your enemies are great and mighty, but I'll 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 rescue them from from under um, their thumb, under their power, under their yoke. Right, that's the first decree, a decree of salvation. But then verse 14, now he addresses Nineveh, the Nineveh king or emperor. Verse 14, Yahweh has issued a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. I will cut off idol and image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave for you are contemptible. So again, pointed, uh, says it. (laughs) All your idols are gone and I will will dig your own grave, right? That's the initial sort of opening decree. What we have through the rest of the book, right? And, and, and I, I put those in the same sort of green box because the reality is all of chapter one is this sort of opening, right? We see this opening description of God, this warning and these decrees, and that sets up the rest of the book that we're going to see um, is, is more or less this this description of the overthrow of Nineveh. But notice the heading I gave it, restoration of Israel and overthrow of Nineveh. One of the things that's really interesting or or instructive rather is when you when you look at this and you pick up in verse 15, you walk all the way through the end of chapter, excuse me, when you pick up in chapter 1 and verse 15 and read all the way through the end of chapter 3, what 
you'll, you'll, you'll sense the overall emphasis, the overall content, the, the majority of the content is centered on the overthrow of Nineveh. Um, you, you know, chapter 2, verses 3 and following, 3 all the way down through uh, verse 8 and 9, um, well, really through verse 10, sorry, um, y- you see this description of the battle against him. You've got the, the infantry attack. You've got the chariot raid. You've got them mount- coming up the walls. You've got them breaching. You've got them leading captives away. You've got them plenty, right? It's this description of the overthrow of Nineveh. But the way this whole section is framed is by the announcement, the promise of the restoration of Israel, right? Again, what we said, salvation, restoration is inextricably linked with the dealing with evil, injustice, violent oppressors, right? And so notice how this section begins in verse 15 of chapter 1. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. Do you recognize that word, good news? Maybe some of you say, say uh, good tidings. Um, in the Septuagint, that's euangelion. That's the same word that we have for gospel, right? So this, this whole section that is that is largely about the overthrow of Nineveh is framed by this announcement of the gospel, right? And, and, and it's, it's echoing some sections from Isaiah 40 and Isaiah 52. And Isaiah 52 in particular, again, how lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, who, annou- who announces peace and salvation and says, your God reigns. All right, that's exactly what Nahum's describing. He sees the same vision, right? You've been oppressed by this power and, and, and appreciate, let me say this as well, appreciate being the people of, of Judah. You're this small nation, right? You've got fortified cities and, and uh, you're, you know, you're built up on mountains and things like that. But the reality is you're no match for a superpower like an Assyria or a Babylon. Like, like was shown, they'll, they'll have a siege and they'll surround you and hem you in and you're going to end up like we see in, in, in Second Kings when, when Assyria sieged Samaria, um, th- they have these famines where, where you've got mothers eating their own children, right? Because it's so bad, right? So, so the reality is here's this small nation that's no match for this superpower um, and constantly under threat of attack from, from Assyria and from Babylon, these big superpowers, and then even their, their neighboring nations that would constantly rage and raid and, and cause all these problems, right? To think, uh, we, 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 we don't relate to that as well because in, in the world today, America, we are the superpower. Uh, we're not out of pressing like the Assyrians or the Babylonians, but, but like we, we're in the place of power. You know, we, we recognize, yeah, Russia's a threat. Korea's a threat. China's a threat. But probably most of us, don't go around each day um, worrying when they're going to strike. It's probably not on our radar to actually think of them as an active, imminent threat. Um, yet that's, that's how Israel would have, would have been in this, in this time, day, and, day and age. And so to hear this message that look out on the mountains, here's a messenger, he's running, and his message is gospel, peace, you know how that peace was secured? Their enemies, their oppressors, were taken out, were defeated, met their end, and so they're free. There's relief. And so he says, celebrate your feast, O Judah. Pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. The one who scatters has com- comes up against you. Man the fortress, watch the road, strengthen your back, summon all your strength, for Yahweh will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, even though devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. Right? You're in this place where you've experienced the defeat. You've been the victim of the oppressor. Um, good news is coming peace, restoration. You will know glory. You'll know freedom. You'll know rejoicing. You can celebrate, right? 
looking at time, I, I realize now I don't, don't have the time to, to read all of chapter 2 and 3. Um, take the time to do that and, and, and just again take in this, this overarching description of the overthrow of this oppress, oppressive power. But I do want to draw your attention to the very last verse of chapter 3. Um, look at verse 19. Again, as he's, as he's continuing to just describe the effects of their overthrow and, and the, the fallout and just walk through the, those, those things, he says, there's no relief for your breakdown. Your wound is incurable. And then listen to this final, final bit. All who hear about you will clap their hands over you for on whom has not your evil passed continually. Right? So here is Nineveh who's, who's look at 3.1. Woe to the bloody city, completely full of lies and pillage. Her prey never departs. The, nose, the noise of the whip of the rattling wheel, galloping horses. Right? Here is this, this people who has just um, filled their cities with bloodshed and war and violence, who've built up their empire, uh, who have become prosperous and wealthy uh, on, on, uh, by oppressing others, right? They, they've done all this violence. They've done all this evil. Who's going to come to their aid? Who's going to come and save them when Babylon comes in to attack them? Nobody. What everybody's going to do is, yes. Um, it, it, most of you, many of you probably have seen uh, the Star Wars f- films. You think about Return of the Jedi. Think about that final scene, right? After the emperor is, is killed, and I'll say killed, after the emperor is killed um, and the Death Star blows up and the imp- empire crumbles, what's, what's that last scene, Right? All these snapshots across the galaxy, all these different planets, all these different civilizations, what's everybody doing? Yeah, they're throwing a party, they're celebrating, right? Because the evil, oppressive empire has been thrown down, right? That's what Nahum's getting at in a much more real stakes kind of way. And so you want to you get to the heart of Nahum, right? Imagine a powerful and prosperous nation or institution, right? It doesn't have to just be a, a, a political, you know, entity. It can be any institution, um, any kind of regime, any, any, you know, any kind of human trafficking ring or whatever you would say, but any powerful and prosperous nation or institution built on the oppression of others. You can get that in your mind, right? People who have, who or in, these, these systems that are, are built up through slavery, through taking land and, and conquering land and by, by killing um, people that, that oppose them or enslaving them or, or mistreating them or relocating them or whatever that is, right? The way the Assyrians would, would relocate the people groups they, they conquer, right? Picture any, any power like that and understand Nahum is a message of comfort to the victims of such oppression, right? Um, Nahum is, is really speaking to um, the people. Let's go back to our Star Wars analogy. Nahum's speaking to the people who are being oppressed by the empire, the people fighting in the rebellion, saying the empire is going to fall, right? Um, and I don't say that to... to make Nahum trivial just to give us a reference point. Um, more appropriately, more powerfully, uh, anyone who's been a victim of any kind of abuse, any kind of oppression, any kind of injustice, any kind of wrong, Nahum says, God sees it. God hears it. God hears your cries and your groans and your aches, and he's going to do something about it take refuge in him. All right, we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, again, I've got another slide for um, our, our, our step back questions. What does Nahum reveal about God? What does is, what is Nahum reveal about God's will for us? What does Nahum reveal about God's purpose? Um, 
Uh, you know the drill by now. If you've been if you've been with us throughout our study so far, I'd encourage you to to spend some time in Nahum and, and answer those questions. Again, our goal is we want to know God. Um, our goal in this study is not just about acquiring some some uh, head knowledge to win a Bible trivia game, but we want to know these books of the Bible, the Micahs and the Nahums, um, regardless of where they necessarily connect or resonate with our own experiences. We, we want to lay aside our assumptions and, and, and have ears to hear so that we can ultimately know God. So anyway, I'd, I'd urge you to, to spend some time in reflection, read and pray and try to answer some of those questions. What does Nahum reveal about God? What does Nahum reveal about God's will for us? And what does Nahum reveal about God's purpose? Um, let's take some time to, to pray. Um, and, and I'll say this, I, um, I, di- I didn't get any details. Uh, I only saw just very briefly that there was a, some kind of incident at the Capitol today related to, to the Electoral College, I would imagine, and some things like that. Uh, and not knowing the details, but, but understanding just briefly that there was some violence involved. I want to pray about that. Um, um, but any, anyway, so, so if, if, uh, if my prayer sounds a little ignorant, that's, that's why I'd, I only saw like a headline and not, not anything more than that. But I still want to pray about that. Um, and and I'll, uh, for all of us, as we continue to, to, to groan through the, the, the momentum of some of the struggles we've faced in, in 2020 into this new year, I want to pray about those things as well. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, we fully um, entrust ourselves to you who judge righteously, who is merciful and wise and gracious and compassionate in justice and judgment. Um, you are gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And yet we know you are um, slow to anger and that you will yet by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And so again, we, we entrust ourselves to you as the judge to sort it all out and to take away what's wrong in the world, um, to work it out and to, to, to make things right. And we're so thankful for the way you do it because we recognize the selfishness in our own hearts, um, the pride in our own hearts, the ways we've contributed to, to the mess that's in the world. Um, and we're so thankful for your grace and for your compassion and for your, your patience and your slowness to act because you, you, you woo us and call us to repentance to, 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 um, and, and gr- are so willing to grant pardon even to the, to the worst transgressor and violator. Um, and so we're so thankful that you are the judge uh, and that you've not left us to um, sort through this mess on our own. And, and so we take refuge in you and trust you uh, with all that we have. Father, please be with our nation um, as we're in a, a, a period of um, extra divisiveness um, where truth seems so clouded and, um, there's um, so much um, misinformation, partial information, um, so many different things that are said from from different news sources, and everybody thinks they're right, and and it, it's it, there's just such a, a messiness to it all. Um, I ask that you would work for good and that you would uh, equip your people with wisdom, um, with integrity, with uh, a a strong sense of what's right and what's wrong, with a, with a ultimate and higher and uncompromising allegiance to you and to your son and to the gospel to the purpose and nature and, and uh, work of your kingdom. Um, 
Father, you know the, the, the events that, that happened today at the Capitol. Um, and so I ask that you would, you would be with um, any, anyone who is hurt or uh, be with the, the senators and our, our officials and leaders and be with the police uh, forces and, and all those who are involved and just please be at work um, for good. Um, may in this, this darkness and chaos, may uh, your light be seen um, in, in whatever way you would, you would shine it, um, but may it also be through us, through, through our wisdom and our love and our grace and our integrity as we, as we navigate these things. Please be with us as we um, continue to, to groan through the, the pandemic um, from grown from inconvenience and grown from, from heartache and loss and, and fear and anxiety and all these, these things. Um, please walk with us, go before us and, and go beside us and um, help us. Um, may in all things we, we cling to you, we encourage and support uh, one another, that we love one another, that we love our neighbor and that we uh, live Christ in, in every way. Um, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus we pray. Amen.